Another massive week of finance and property news. Much of it centred on households and their finances, as the regulators home in on the risks in the mortgage market. But is it too little too late? Welcome to the Property Imperative Weekly to the 14th of October 2017. Hi, I'm Martin North, Principal Analyst at Digital Finance Analytics. We start our review of this week's finance and property news with the RBA's Financial Stability Report. This quarterly report, which ran to 62 pages, said that international economic conditions and local business confidence are on the improve, whilst banks now hold more capital, have tightened lending standards, and the shadow banking sector is under control. But, they say, Australian household balance sheets and the housing market remain a core area of interest. And from a financial stability perspective, this is the key risk. They showed that one third of people with mortgages have less than one month's buffer. And their key concern is the negative impact on future growth as households hunker down. So, nothing new really and nothing to answer the IMF's downgraded Australian growth forecast. Given the first half result in 2017 was 1.2%, a second half forecast of circa 1% is hardly stellar. And the sudden rebound to 3% next year, some may say, appears courageous. The IMF also revised up the unemployment rate suggesting that it would remain at 5.6% rather than falling to 5.3% as they'd estimated earlier. This plus slow wage growth highlights the issues underlying the economy. They also warned about risks from high debt, saying that growth in household debt relative to GDP is associated with a greater probability of a banking crisis. And of course, Australia is right up there. On the same day, the ABS released their latest housing occupancy cost data. The average household with an owner-occupied mortgage is paying, they say, around $450 a week, which is slightly lower than the peak a couple of years ago. This equates to around 16% of gross household income on average. But of course, the true story is that interest rates have fallen to all-time lows, which has allowed people to borrow more as prices rise. And as a result, should interest rates start to bite, this will cause real pain. Plus, we have recent flat wage growth in real terms in the past couple of years. Finally, households have a bigger mortgage held for longer, which is great for the banks, but not helpful from a household perspective as it erodes savings into retirement. And it means that more older Australians are still borrowing as they transition from the workforce. Earlier in the week, the ABS also released their latest household finance data which showed that ADI lending rose 0.6% in the month, or 2.1% seasonally adjusted. Within that, lending for owner-occupied housing rose 0.9%, or 2.1% seasonally adjusted, and investor loans rose 0.2% in trend terms, or a massive 4.3% in seasonally adjusted terms. So lending growth is apparent and signals more household debt ahead. First-time buyers continue to extend their reach, despite the fact that we are seeing peak price for property at the moment. In original terms, the number of first-time buyers, as a percentage of the total owner-occupied housing finance commitments, rose to 17.2% in August, up from 16.6% in July. AFG's latest mortgage index showed that property investor appetite is falling, whilst first-time buyers and property upgraders are more active. First-time buyers are reacting to the recent incentives put in place in Victoria and New South Wales, they said. City published a 54-page report on the highly topical subject of interest-only loans, and we provided data from our core market model to assist their research. Even after recent regulatory tightening, they said that underwriting standards in Australia are still more generous than in some other countries at 5.3 times income, compared with 3.7 times in the UK, 
4.4 times in Canada and 4.9 times in New Zealand. They conclude that there are vulnerabilities in the interest-only sector, both from property investors and owner-occupied interest-only loan holders. Overall, this is, we estimate, more than 680 billion of the 1.6 trillion mortgage book. They say that tighter lending criteria and rising house prices have meant that investors increasingly face net negative cash flows and investors face a growing household cash flow gap and reducing capital gains expectations. The large levels of debt outstanding by borrowers aged in their 50s and 60s means many investors will need to sell property to discharge their debts. Owner-occupied interest-only borrowers are more susceptible to interest rate rises given higher average borrowing levels and higher average loan to value ratios. And so they concluded, given the widespread use of interest only finance and the reduced prospects of discharging debt via means other than liquidation of portfolio holdings, banks must face an increased risk of mis-selling claims in future years. And mining towns serve as a microcosm of this threat. ASIC updated their work on interest-only loans, finding that Australia's major banks have cut back their interest-only lending by $4.5 billion over the past year. However, other lenders have partially offset this decline by increasing their share of interest-only lending. They say that borrowers who used brokers were more likely to obtain an interest-only loan compared to those who went directly to a lender. And borrowers approaching retirement age continue to be provided with a significant number of interest-only loans. Now ASIC will next examine individual loan files to ensure that lenders are providing interest-only home loans in appropriate circumstances to ensure that consumers are not paying for more expensive products that are unsuitable under the responsible lending provisions. In this light, it was interesting to listen to the big banks' CEOs in front of the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Economics. Westpac's CEO said half of his 400 billion mortgage portfolio was interest only. The other banks were closer to 40%. While both Westpac and ANZ said, we don't lend to people who can't pay it back, it doesn't make sense for us to do so. The underwriting standards are, we think, way too loose, as the recent regulatory tightening highlights. But it's probably too late, especially for interest-only loans, which now would fall outside the current still generous standards. In an excellent The Conversation article, Richard Holden, Professor of Economics at University of New South Wales, rightly highlighted the spooky parallels between our current situation and the US mortgage market prior to the GFC. Australia's large proportion of five-year interest-only loans turbocharged by out-of-control negative gearing regimes look spookily similar. It's one thing for borrowers to do silly things. When it becomes dangerous is when lenders not only facilitate that stupidity, but encourage it. That seems to have been what has happened in Australia, he said. Smaller lenders are still feeling the pressure, as illustrated by the Bank of Queensland's results which came out this week. While the headline profit was up, underlying growth was lower and mortgage lending was the key. Net interest margin fell to 1.87%, but it was better in the second half. Interest only loans were 40% in the second half of 2016 and 39% in the first half of 17, but trending down, they say. 8% of loans are above 90% LVR and 19% are between 81 and 90%. During the hearing, the big banks also confirmed that they had repriced their mortgage back books, especially for interest only and investment loans, but weirdly denied this was to increase profitability. The quote of the week for me was one CEO saying that people should switch from interest only loans to principal interest loans because they were cheaper, which may be true from a headline interest rate perspective, but the monthly repayments when switching are significantly higher. So in reality, it is not cheaper in cash flow terms. There was conflicting data relating to foreign property investors, especially from China, with Credit Suisse saying that they estimate, based on stamp duty records, 
that foreign buyers are acquiring the equivalent of 25% of new house supply in New South Wales, 17% in Victoria and 8% in Queensland. If they're correct, this may put a floor on home prices and they suggest that crackdowns on capital outflows by Chinese authorities appear not to have slowed China's appetite for Australian property. On the other hand, while the NAB Residential Property Index rose six points in quarter three, they highlighted lower foreign buying activity in new property markets, with Victoria seeing the share fall to 14.4%, down from 20%, and New South Wales down to 7.8% from 12% in Q2. But in contrast, Queensland saw a rise to 11.4%, up from 8.6% last quarter. NAB also revised its national house price forecast, predicting an increase of 3.4% next year, down from 4.3%, and easing to 2.5% in 2019. Unit prices are forecast to rise just 0.5% next year, and a modest fall is expected in 2019. Our data suggests that Chinese buyers are indeed still active, with a focus on certain postcodes where high-rise units are being built, and often offered direct to overseas buyers. We also see evidence of some high rollers buying larger houses. But overall, there is not enough to support home prices into next year. We published the September update of the Digital Finance Analytics Household Finance Security Index, which underscored the growing gap between, on one hand, employment, which remains relatively strong, and the financial security of households. The index fell from 98.6 in August down to 97.5 in September. The state-by-state -state view highlights a fall in New South Wales whilst Victoria holds higher and there was a rise in WA from February 2017 lows. This highlights the fact that households across the nation are under different levels of pressure. Tracking by age bands, we find younger households are significantly less confident compared with those aged 50 to 60 years but across the board, the general trend is lower. Similar findings were contained in the latest AlphaWise survey conducted by Morgan Stanley. Income growth has not recovered. Costs of living inflation is re-accelerating and macro prudential related tightening of credit conditions is extending from housing into consumer finance. They say Australian households are in a vulnerable financial position especially those who have taken out a mortgage and in an era of weak income growth, soaring energy prices and high levels of indebtedness with the prospect of higher interest rates on the way, many intend to cut discretionary spending in anticipation of even tighter household budgets. And that's bad news, not only for Australia's retail sector, but also for the broader economy. They forecast discretionary consumption volumes will slow to just 0.2% in 2018 and dragging the overall consumption growth down to 1.1%, well below the consensus of 2.5%. And so, in summary, the evidence is building that we are entering a concerning episode where growth is likely to be lower, households remain under pressure, and risks in the system are considerably higher than the RBA is willing to concede. The mystery, though, is why the regulators are still allowing mortgage lending to grow way faster than inflation and wages. This surely must be slowed, and soon. Once again, too little, too late. So that's the Property Imperative Weekly to the 14th of October. If you found this useful, do leave a comment below, subscribe to receive future updates, and check back next week. Many thanks for watching.